So uh, my project is a uh, title flooding effects on temporary plants in the Southern Great Plains and agricultural GIS study. My, I was working with my mentor, Travis Witt, and um, his colleague, uh, Colton Flynn. Um, I'll introduce the purpose of the study by you know, reading uh, the paragraphs. So weather in the Southern Great Plains is highly variable with on average 200 millimeter meters or almost eight inches of uh, precipitation in wet years compared to dry years. Then excessive water in wet years can lead to increased flooding on croplands due to increase in storm intensity and greater time between rainfall events. Much of the Southern Great Plains has grown winter wheat with fallow fields during the summer for many decades. The state of Oklahoma produces 4.3 million acres of wheat. Um, uh, overuse of winter wheat and summer fallow rotations has increased erosion, decreased organic matter, and decreased the water holding uh, capacity of soils. The top 10 centimeters of soil is especially sensitive to management. One choice to reduce erosion and increase soil organic matter is the use of legumes. A summer soybean crop is predicted to reduce soil erosion compared to conventionally tilled summer fallow field after winter wheat. An alternative plant that uses less water and has similar forage benefits is tepary. Although tepary uses less water during the growing season than soy and bean, little is known about flood tolerance in tepary. This study was conducted at the USDA ARS Grazing Lands Research Laboratory in El Reno, Oklahoma. The experiment comprised of tree tubes within a greenhouse. Treatment combinations were performed with unflooded plants and flooded plants for three and five days beginning at the V2 stage. Temporary, plant, temporary was planted at six plants per entry. Temporary was then harvested to measure above and below ground biomass at 30 days post treatment. Now, down here is the soil infiltration map that I'll zoom into more later. Um, the soil infiltration map shows that group A soils have low runoff potential and high infiltration rates when, the, when thoroughly wetted. They consist mostly of deep, well to excessively drained sand or gravel and have a high rate of water transmission greater than 0.3 inches per hour. Group B soils have moderate infiltration rate, rates when thoroughly wetted and consists mostly of moderately deep to deep, moderately well to well drained soils with moderately fine to moderately coarse textures. These soils have moderate rate, have a moderate rate of water transmission, 0.15 to 0.3 inches per hour. Now the group C soils have low infiltration rates when thoroughly wetted and consist mostly of soils with in, with a layer that impedes downward movement of water and soils with moderately fine to fine texture. These soils have lo a low rate of water transmission of 0.05 to 0.15 inches per hour. The group D soils have high runoff potential. They have very low infiltration rates when thoroughly wetted and consist mostly of clay soils with a high swelling potential, soils with a permanent high water table, soils with a clay pan or a clay layer at or near the surface, and shallow soils over nearly impervious material. These soils have a very low rate of water transmission, 0 to 0.05 inches per hour. The, the data sources that we used for this GIS study were temporary seeds, 30, 33 accessions, and one soybean control. NOAA provided the precipitation data from the 
Hydro Meteorological Design Study Center. It was precipita precipitation frequency data. And um, ArcGIS um, had the soil hydrologic group raster, which is what you see here. Um, the measurements that were taken from the temporary plants were uh, their biomass and fresh and dry weights. Uh, and from the um, precipitation data, we grabbed average rainfall in inches in 24 hour and three day increments over one year and five years. Um, the analysis used um, to analyze the fresh and dry weights uh, was the ANOVA procedure through the SAS Studio. And for the precipitation data in ArcGIS, uh, we used uh, the Kriging method. And what the Kriging method is useful for is that it assumes that there is a, a distance or direction between sample points that reflects a spatial correlation. And the Kriging, um, as you can see in the, the way these uh, colors, the Kansas and Oklahoma are color coded, um, is in geometrical intervals. And what that means is that each class range has approximately the same number of values in each class and that the change between intervals is fairly consistent. So um, I should have used a different set of colors, but the darker colors doesn't mean that there's more of a concentration of data in that area. It just means that it's just a different class of values. And so these are the results for the temporary. The fresh weight, uh, you could see that the one day is of, of flooding had a higher rate uh, weight than the control or the three day. And even in the dry weight, the one day flooded plants continue to have a higher weight than the control or the three day. Uh, the conclusions that we made from the study were that uh, three days of flooding greatly reduced the biomass of temporary plants. Both Kansas and Oklahoma do not receive enough rainfall to flood temporary plants for one to three days. And producers of temporary will not have to worry about flooding on average for one to five years. And uh, thanks again to the, to the rain um, uh, program and to my mentor that I had a really great experience. Um, if you have any questions, you could say it now. I know we're pressed for time. So 